Well, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see you all. And uh, wonderful just to be able to worship together. And obviously, yeah, it's just a delight to have been on the weekend. To those of us who were able to be there, that was such a treat. To those who weren't, um, uh, I sorry about that. Um, and the messages, I think, will be put online, so you'll be able to hear some of the teaching that we had. Um, but uh, God will bless you nonetheless. So there we go. Right. Um, so we are in Jonah chapter 2. So, yes, as I say, page 920 in the church Bibles, if you have a, a church Bible. And, yeah, just to let you know, uh, in bad guys, they are actually good guys. Yeah, but don't worry. We're not indoctrinating our children to be bad guys. So I saw it in the cinema with my children, and it's quite good fun. Anyway, okay, so here we go. We're in Jonah chapter 2. And um, actually, we're in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, because Dave kindly gave me the fish. So Dave did chapter 1 and thought, I'll just leave that bit with Simon. Although, funnily enough, in the Hebrew actual uh, version of the Old Testament, this is verse 1 of chapter 2. Um, so Dave knew exactly what he was doing. And uh, you'll see there's a sense in which this verse and the final verse of chapter 2 are kind of brackets. That In the first one, Jonah gets swallowed, and in the second one, Jonah gets spat out again. So it kind of fits. So here we go. Chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for your precious word and your presence with us, that you are Emmanuel, the Lord who is with us. Thank you, you're with us now. And thank you that your power on our behalf is mighty, that those who are with us are more than those who are against us, that your power on our behalf is glorious. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful story and all that it points to. We pray, please, will you speak to our hearts through it and gain great glory for yourself by strengthening us in your power and helping us to find your mighty deliverance. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us into increasing confidence and joy and boldness in our God, that you would help us, Lord, not to fear, but to be increasingly fearless. Thank you. It says in your word that the wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Make us bold as lions, we pray. And show us the Lord Jesus in this. Holy Spirit, we welcome you again. We say, please show us the Lord Jesus in your word. We ask in Jesus' name. And again, just encourage you, take a moment to ask God to speak to you this morning. Do your best to open your heart to whatever he may want to say to you this morning. Go ahead and ask him to speak. Open your heart to him. Amen. Amen. Well, let's not get hooked on the fish bit. 
Some people get very distracted by the fish element of the story. We don't want to spend too much time getting distracted by that. Just a couple quick things. Apparently, some whales, the mouth and throat cavity can be 14 feet long and eight feet wide. So not just you, but your whole life group could fit in there, potentially. All right. So we don't want to get too distracted by that. There was an occasion, apparently, in 1891, when a sailor called James Barclay was swallowed by a whale. Uh, the whale was killed, and he was found in the stomach of the whale alive, apparently emotionally disturbed. Um, but he did survive. Apparently his skin was quite bleached by the acids in the whale's stomach, but he survived. Now, I found out this week <clears throat> that it takes Neptune 165 years to orbit the sun, or one year on Neptune. 165 years to orbit the sun. And God didn't struggle to make that. I think God can make a fish as big as he likes to swallow someone for as long as he likes and do whatever he likes. So I'm not particularly troubled by the fish element of the story. And I think that actually it's not the main point, really, is it? It's interesting, it says in the Hebrew, or it can be translated, where it says here that the Lord appointed a great fish, it could be translated, the Lord had appointed. God had appointed a great fish. The idea being not only can God do this, but God already had the wheels fully in motion. So I, yeah, I know you're going to do that. And yeah, we've already got a whale is ready for you or a big fish. You know, it's kind of God's total sovereignty over these things is not ultimately a challenge. God is God. He is well able to do whatever he likes. And it's interesting just to note as well that Jesus did speak about Jonah as a real historical figure and assumed the veracity of this account. And so I don't think we're at liberty to kind of pick and choose which bits of the Bible we're going to accept or not. The bigger point is why was it necessary and what does it tell us? The bigger point was what was going on in this occasion? Why was Jonah swallowed? Uh, what does it tell us? And you could say that in many ways, what we see in the whole account is an extraordinary picture of salvation. Really, it is a, it's a salvation story. It's a man who is lost and then found. It's a man who is, some would even say, actually dead. Some people believe Jonah died and was raised to life. Now, the text doesn't make it explicitly clear. It's kind of speculative. But the guy, you know, he is well and truly a goner, and yet he is rescued and he is saved. And so it's certainly a picture of salvation, which you could say is the theme of the whole Bible. Salvation is the great story. Jesus' own name means Yahweh saves. That's what God does. He's a rescuing God. He's a saving God. And this picture or this story gives us such a kind of graphic portrayal of that whole motif, that whole story, that whole reality, salvation coming. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. Interesting to think Jonah could have been given all kinds of instruction at the bottom of the ocean. That would not have helped him. You know, if he was given sort of some principles to consider, even the Sermon on the Mount, you know, he could have been given all kinds of, Jonah, you really should think about X, Y, and Z. He needed saving. And what God offers us in the Bible, and what God offers us in his son is salvation, not simply self-betterment, not just principles and ways of kind of improving our lives. You get saved or you don't when you're at the bottom of the ocean. You're not, you're not going to figure it out from there. He doesn't need swimming lessons. He needs salvation. And similarly, we ourselves are dependent on God for deliverance, for rescue, for salvation. And that's what we're going to see in this. And so I've called the message deliverance from distress. Now, some of you may be tempted to think, I don't know if this has very much relevance for me because I'm not at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I'm not planning to kind of sink anytime soon. Uh, or, you, or you may just think, well, you know, life is kind of, it's kind of coasting along all right. I don't necessarily, you know, if someone was at the edge of death, then maybe this is the relevant message for them. But is it relevant for me? I think you'll see as we go forward that it genuinely really is. And uh, I trust you'll see that as we go. Because the interesting thing about Jonah is that really his, you know, his story at this point is a phenomenal U-turn, isn't it? I mean, it really is like Dave pointed out uh, when we were looking at this a couple of weeks ago. You see this recurrence of the word down. Yeah. Jo God comes to him in verse one and you know, verse two, arise and go to Nineveh. 
And yet it says, verse 3, he rose and went to Tarshish. And he went away from the presence of the Lord, went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it. And it goes, it says he went down into the heart of the ship. And it's kind of down, 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 down. He sank into a deep sleep. And then eventually he gets chucked into the water and goes to the depths of the roots of the mountains. You couldn't really get any lower, it seems. We'll see in a sense you can actually go lower still. He, he goes right down as low as you can go. And then he gets brought right back up. It's this incredible sense of uh, it's an extraordinary U-turn of the story. But the funny thing is that actually the kind of up position that he sort of ends up in, he, he could have skipped an awful lot of this bit. Yeah, he could have just gone, kind of gone the obedient way. <laughs> so you may feel I'm not down here, so I don't need the help. Or maybe you do feel like you're down here, in which case I really hope this will help you. But you may, you may not feel like you're down there. Well, that's okay. We, how, we want to end up where he ends up. We want to end up with God. And so this is instructive for all of us, regardless of where we are on this kind of journey. Okay, so I trust you'll find that this is relevant for all of us. None of us want to end up going further away from God. All of us want to walk closer to God, or at least I hope that that's the case. And if it's not, I trust that this will help us to realize why that is worth doing. Okay, so we're just going to look at it under two simple headings, really. Firstly, Jonah's distress, and then secondly, Jonah's deliverance. Okay, Jonah's distress and Jonah's deliverance. Now, the reality is that for all of us, we will all and do all suffer distress in varying degrees. What do we do with that? If you were at the weekend away, as Bob said, you know, you can have that kind of sense of, oh, isn't this wonderful? We're together and there's a real peace and a joy and a sort of like, yay, this is great. doesn't feel like that on Monday morning, Tuesday morning necessarily. It doesn't feel like that in the course of the week. And you can have those extraordinary moments of, wow, this is like a mountaintop experience where the, the nearness of God seems so sweet and the sense of his love is so apparent and his kindness towards me and I feel his affection for me and I feel so safe with him. And then sometimes it can be moments and you're suddenly plunged into something that feels nothing like that at all. You see that in, in Matthew 17, where you've got the transfiguration, where uh, Peter, James, and John go up the mountain with Jesus. They see Jesus transfigured. He shines like the sun. It's this incredible kind of moment of revelation of his glory. And they're like, oh. And Simon Peter says, let's build three tents. Let's stay up here. Let's, this, is, this is a great place for us to be. And you can kind of think like that at a weekend away. You think, oh, this is a good, you know, why don't we kind of just do this? This is nice. And, uh, and you know, obviously they can't. And only moments later, they come down the mountain and encounter a boy full of demons and the disciples trying to get the demons out and failing. And it's sort of like the, the contrast between the highs and the lows of Christian living can sometimes be enough to make you feel seasick. You just say, oh, my word. It's like, I, thought, I thought I was getting somewhere. I thought I was learning how to do this Christian life. Why am I down in the jolly depths again? Why am I wrestling with doubts again? I thought I'd resolved this. Why am, I, why am I depressed again? I thought I was past that. Why, why, why are the financial difficulties that are happening to us, they're really screwing around with everything. My sense of peace is really gone. My equilibrium is really shot to pieces. I feel like I kind of lost my way. You can go through moments like that as a Christian and feel utterly bewildered. Because you think, I thought, I, I kind of thought I was getting the hang of this Christian life. And then you think, oh man, I just blew it again. Why am I still looking at stuff I shouldn't look at? Why am I still riddled with lustful thoughts? Why is it that I'm still like, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever area of temptation that you may wrestle with and struggle with, why, why is this happening? Why is it, you know, you can feel like that. And you can sometimes, it can be utterly despondent as a result. And there can be those moments, as we'll see in Jonah's story, where you just think, this is, been, I'm, I'm a washed up, done deal here. There's, it's game over for me. And it's the wonderful thing about this story. Absolutely wonderful. And there's a number, and I kind of keep track of them. <laughs> I keep finding them in the Bible. These bits where it just looks like it's game over for this guy. It's just finished. It's just like, he didn't just kind of slip up. He screwed up. He, he like really, and he's convinced it's done. I'm finished. I'm washed up. And he's not. Because that's the kind of God we have. And it's so precious to see that in Jonah's story. 
So as we see his distress, the well, first thing just to notice is the reality of it. And in a sense, the kind of finality of it, the sense in which it just feels like game over. We went to um, the Spectrum in Guildford yesterday uh, with our kids, uh, the swimming thingy, leisure pools and what have you. And my son Isaac is, he's a strange young lad. Um, <laughs> he's wonderful. I love him to bits. But he's quite happy to just drown. You know, he doesn't mind. Uh, he's like, <laughs> you know, I'm like trying to help him. You know, and the water's getting deeper and it kind of, you know, there's bits where it gets shallower, bits where it gets deeper. And he's just kind of pushing me away. He's pushing me like, son, if, if I let go of you, you will die now. You know, <laughs> so you, you're going to drown if I don't. Oh, just, just, yeah. And he just wants to just jump straight in. And he, I think, you know, obviously at points we've let him do stuff with, you know, armbands on and stuff. And he's kind of thinks buoyancy is automatic. You know? <laughs> Yesterday, he's just wearing a swimming thing, a little kind of wetsuit, keeping warm. And, uh, and he just wants to chuck himself in. He just like happily kind of throw himself in. He's like, you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't get it. Now, that's, that's this much water. You know, a, a little boy could have drowned in that much water. But Jonah's at the heart of the ocean. There's no getting up. There's no getting out from there. There's no daddy with big arms to pick you up. You, you, you just, you're gone, yeah? So the first thing just to notice is it's, it's really, it's a finished deal for him is how it seems. You know, so he says, I call out of my distress into the deep, verse 3, into the heart of the seas. The floods surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. It's like the water's closed in, verse 5, over me to take my life. This is finished. Game over. The deep surrounded me. The weeds are wrapped around my head. How gone do you have to be? That the roots of the mountain went down. His bars closed upon me forever. It's just, you know, and that's the, the incredible thing. Just the sheer reality of distress. And that's where people who, and we don't, so I trust you don't need to worry about it too much, but people who preach a kind of prosperity gospel message can be so unhelpful because they make it sound like the Christian life is one big victory. It's one big kind of, you know, it's just upwards and upwards and upwards. And that's just not the case, that you can go through significant distress as a child of God, as a prophet of God. Distress to the point where you think, I'm lost. It's done. And so we, we just need to recognize that that is a part of Christian living. Be encouraged. <laughs> Be encouraged that your downs are no proof that you're no believer, that your difficult times, your dark times, your depressed times, your struggles with sin, your battles, your, your fights, your dark days, they are no evidence that God is not with you. Jonah gets as low as it can be, and he is the focal point of history at this moment. And God's attention is entirely kind of focused on this man. We can think in our moments of kind of defeat. It's just like, I've lost God. No, no, you haven't. Okay, so firstly, we see the reality of his distress. Secondly, we see God's apparent opposition in his distress, which makes it worse still. So we see, he says in verse uh, in, well, in verse 2, it says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Now, at this point, we're talking about sinking into like the afterlife, into a place of separation from God, or at least, you know, kind of lostness from life. And then verse 4, I am driven away from your sight. Jonah's not just at this point thinking, I'm sunk in water. No, I'm, and, and it can be translated, I am expelled. There's a finality to that. I'm just gone. I'm rejected. I'm exiled. I'm, I'm, he has had enough. He has said goodbye, good riddance, end of. Now, it's possible, and it, it may well not be the case for anyone in the room. I don't know. But it is possible to get to the point in this life where you can be convinced, that's me. Or you can just think, God's done with me. I'm finished. He's surely finished with me. And Jonah is convinced that's the case for him. You cast me into the deep uh, and, and I'm driven away from your sight. He says the bars are closed upon me forever. But, you know, it's like I'm, I'm totally done now. My life is fainting away. I'm just. And the devil loves to persuade people that's where they sit. You are a victim who will be forever bound. That's, that's the kind of thing that the devil loves to kind of persuade you of. You'll never get past this sin. You will always be bound by it. And I've been there where you just think, 
that's just me. I'm just done. I'm, you know, may, maybe, maybe I'll get to heaven. Maybe he will save me ultimately. But I will only ever live in defeat until then. For me, I was completely convinced of that. I remember years in the past where I just thought, for, for me, pornography, it was like, I just like it. I'm, I'm snared in it. I, will, I was convinced I will never escape this. It is an inescapable snare. And maybe God loves me. And maybe, maybe I'll still go to heaven. But I'll never get past this because it's just, I'm just entrenched. The, the, the weeds are wrapped around my head. There's no getting out of this. I'm just, this is me. And the devil just loves to do that. He loves to just say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's you. That's you. you. You're just it's who you are. It's where you belong. It's, it's thoroughly right in you. And you're never going to get out of that. And that's a, that's a horrible place to be. And that's what the devil loves to persuade people of. That they are actually lost and that God is against them. That God is opposed. Now the frightening thing is that God does hate sin. And there is such a thing as God being in opposition to people. But where those people say, please, mercy, please, he is swift to rescue. He is eager to restore. He delights to show mercy. He will come and, and lift and rescue and bring breakthrough. He'll come and help. He'll come and restore. He'll come and save. It's what he does. That's what Jesus' name means. That he saves us from our sin. He saves. He is a rescuing God. He's a delivering God. He's a helping God. He's a merciful God, a compassionate God, a forgiving God. And so the, the battle comes for us that we, that we can feel so defeated. And what the devil wants to try to do to you when you're in that place of feeling defeated is just to push you further away. And just like Jonah, just let's get you further down and further down and further down. Because he knows that if you turn and you say, Lord, help. There is a God who's very willing, very happy to help. You know, when Simon Peter's walking on the water... And he sees Jesus is in front. And then he says, you know the story. He looks, he sees the wind and the waves, and he starts to sink. He doesn't wait until he's at the bottom of the ocean before he asks for help. He just immediately, Lord, help. That's, that's, see, the devil loves to just say, no, 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 don't ask for help. He's angry with you. He's against you. You know, he, he loves to try and say, you are driven away from his sight. He doesn't like you anymore. Give up. And he just wants you to go down, 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 down. All it takes, in a sense, is exactly what Simon Peter does. Lord, help. Lord, help. And he is willing to help. He's so happy, gloriously happy to help. It's just beautiful to hear, you know, these things we're singing about this morning or Bob's just praying. You know, the abundance, the abundance of his grace towards us. So if you heard this new Matt Redman album that's just come out, I encourage you to look it up. It's just come out this week. There's a song that talks about God's grace being given. He says, you've given, you've given, you've given. And your grace, it's not even halfway empty. It's like there's so much there. You've given so much. Surely by now you must be running out. You're not even halfway empty. You're nowhere near. You'll never be empty. You'll never be empty of grace for us. So we see that God's, what feels like God's opposition of his distress, uh, in his distress, is part of the thing that, that, that the enemy can try to use and manipulate. You think, oh, God's against me now. And that's what the devil loves to try and persuade us of. And we must be ever so careful that we don't yield to that. Thirdly, we see God's orchestration of his distress. And this is the funny thing. So we've seen the kind of reality of it. You see God's opposition, how he, Jonah sees it as you're against me. I'm driven from your sight. But we see also God's orchestration of his distress. Verse 3, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Isn't that interesting? That Jonah, he's sinking down. He says, you know, these are, these are you cast me <laughs> into the deep. He recognizes God is somehow active in this process. You cast me into the deep. It's your waves and your billows. And so in a strange way, God is both the author of his distress and of his deliverance. That as he sinks, he sort of thinks, God, you've allowed this to happen. Now, at first, that can seem very sinister. Hey, God, God, you did this to me. These are your waves and your, your, your billows. This is, this is your doing. 
We believe God is sovereign. We believe in a sovereign God. And when you emphasize God is sovereign over all things, he's in charge of all things. Nothing happens outside of his care and control. At first, that can seem a very sinister thing because you think, well, then God was active in this terrible disaster. God was active in the earthquake that happened. God was active. And you know, it's like God, his, it, all of this is somehow, if God is sovereign over all, it's much more convenient to say, oh, no, no, God's, there are certain things God can't really reach. You know, there's free will. He can't kind of do much. He's kind of bound. That's not, that's not the picture of God we see in the Bible. And the wonderful thing is this. While at first it seems quite a sinister thought, you think, good grief, God is over all of that. <laughs> is it not more concerning to think it's out of his control? Is it not more concerning to think God couldn't actually control that? It's beyond his reach. There is nothing, not a single atom in the universe outside the control of God. And so what we come to discover is as we learn to trust this God who is over all things, his sovereign control of all things is a solid foundation for our hope that we recognize, okay, I'm going through this. But God, his brow is not wrinkled in heaven. He's not going, oh, what am I going to do? God's in no panic. God is aware of every single part. God, it says, was pleased for his son to be crushed on the cross. Not pleased because he relished that, but because even in something so desperately evil, he was working something gloriously good. So we can trust that the God who is sovereign over all things is working for good, even desperate circumstances. And it's good to have a God like that. It's good to have a God who you think there's nothing outside your control. And every different thing that I face and every battle I experience, all of the different pressures I go through, the betrayals, the terrible things, even abuse, all kinds of awful things that might happen to a person. He was not going, ah, help. He is over it all, can be trusted through it all, and will work it all together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That he's sovereign over all our sorrows, all our sickness, all of our pains and all of the difficulties. And so we don't need to fear that somehow it's gone out of his hands. No, it's all in his hands. So actually God's orchestration in his distress is a good thing. And God will let you go through real hardship sometimes with very good purpose and very good objectives. And actually, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would testify to this. It has been for me the most sorrowful, the most painful, the most difficult chapters of my life that God has accomplished the greatest good in my life. Because sometimes we're as stupid as Jonah and it takes our being dragged into the depths of something before we finally go, okay, God, you win. I'll do it your way. Now, there's a sense in which a lot of that, like I said, can be avoided. If we just learn to look to him. I was saying to Dave earlier, you know, his story and my story are kind of different. Because Dave has been very wise. <laughs> in just going, okay, God, I'll trust you and do it your way. I mean, good night. I could bore you with all the times. I just think, I just go, oh, look, I'll just destroy my life. Oh, no, God will rescue me again. You don't have to do that. You can just go, oh, please can I have some help? And God goes, yeah, I'll help you. It's a much better way of doing things. It's very smart. Okay, well done, Dave. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully I'm learning to be a bit more like Dave. <laughs> okay, so we see God's uh, opposition in his distress, God's orchestration of his distress. But finally, we see in this part, and then we'll come to the second half, God's offer in his distress. God's offer of salvation in the midst of his distress. So he has gone very, very low. And yet he knows what to do. In 2 Chronicles 6, 24, when Solomon is praying for the dedication of the temple, he says, if your people Israel are defeated because they have sinned against you, and they turn again and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, the temple, and then, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land which you gave to them and to their fathers. Jonah knows about this. Jonah knows that the temple represents God's willingness to give grace, God's willingness to forgive sin. And he, it's like when he starts to get to the bottom, he starts to remember, oh yeah, I could ask for help. There is an offer of help. 
We can be convinced that God is against us, but standing, permanent, unfailing, never to be rescinded, always fully sufficient, is his offer of mercy. The temple was just there. You know, Jonah's sinking to the bottom. The temple isn't, meanwhile, kind of quaking and trembling. And, oh, I was, you know, the temple's just boom. It's just there. It's not going to change. It's not going anywhere. God's offer of mercy remains. You know, our lives are plunged into distress. God's offer of mercy is still just as solid as ever it was. It still can be trusted completely. And so as he sinks in, he finally begins to realize there is the offer of mercy. There is the offer of mercy. I must turn towards and find that mercy. So it says, then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. And, you know, at that point, he could just say, just give up then. I just give up. I'm driven away from your sight. But instead, it says this, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. That's what we've got to do. That's what we so need to do. When you start thinking, oh, I've blown it. And he's against me. And I've, oh, no, I sinned or whatever it is. It's just that yet. Coming back to that, that yet, yet I will look again. I will turn and I will say, no, I believe there is a merciful, gracious, forgiving, kind God on the throne of heaven. And he has said, if you confess your sins, he will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the promise of scripture. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a promise. You can build your life on that. That is truth that will never break. More solid than the temple in Jerusalem. God's promise to us that if we confess our sin, he will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we sometimes sink, it's so important we quickly turn. Turn as quickly as possible. Don't do a Jonah and sink as low as you possibly can before you start thinking, oh, I better get some help. Yeah, there's an offer of mercy. So let distress act as a trigger for prayer. That's the, that's the key thing. As soon as you hit the stress, be it ever so minor, ever so minor. You can just nothing. He says, always pray. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, be always praying, always praying. You're not going to annoy him. He's invited you to be always praying. It says, give the Lord no rest. You can just jabber away. <laughs> you, you just keep on praying about anything and everything. I mean, I, my thumbnail is too short. I haven't been praying about it, I must confess. But it ca it's causing me pain when I write at the moment. I, I cut it, it's too short. That's, God doesn't take pleasure in the fact that, that there's pain there. I can, I can bring that to God if I want to. <laughs> okay, you said, there's nothing too small. A friend of mine biting his nails was a significant challenge for him. He prayed about it. He got through. He got through to the other side of biting his nails. What a great victory. But yeah, I mean, I'm being, I don't mean to be silly. Well, I'm making a very significant point here that there's nothing too small that we can't bring to him. We, we turn to him at any given moment. You don't have to be at the bottom of the crisis before you turn and say, Lord, help. Do it. Do it even now. Lord, help me listen to this guy. <laughs> Lord, help me get what I'm supposed to get out of this talk. Lord, help is a very biblical prayer. Lord, help. You, you can pray short prayers, little prayers. You know, short prayers are long enough, as Charles Spurgeon said. Short prayers are long enough. I like that. That's a good quote. Yeah, just, Lord, help. It's good. It's good to pray that way. Lord, help me with this. This conversation is difficult. Lord, help. Oh, my kids are pressing my buttons. Lord, help. We're having a really awkward conversation. Lord, help. The boss is not going to be pleased. Lord, help. I'm getting tired. The sermon is not coming together. Lord, help. <laughs> it could be about anything and everything. Lord, help. And just, just doing it is so, so important. So let distress act as a trigger for prayer. As soon as you feel that prick of difficulty, Lord, help, Lord, help, Lord, help. If prayer can reach him from the depths of the ocean, can it not from where you stand? If his mercy can extend to a man in rampant rebellion, can it not to one who seeks him? If his power can save from the edge of death, can it not from the trial you're facing? If his love remains for the rebellious and disobedient, does it not for the praying believer? There's always help available. Always help available. Now, as we move into the last part here, his deliverance. So we've looked at Jonah's distress, and now we look at Jonah's deliverance, which we'll finish with. Just to point out, the difference between distress and deliverance is a call. That's all it is. 
The difference between distress and deliverance is just a call. It says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Soon we'll be preaching in the, in the Richmond Saturday mornings again. We were doing that a little while ago, open air preaching. And when we were, often I would just say that verse again and again. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because you never know where someone might just remember that little phrase. And then maybe they suddenly, I mean, I heard about a guy just recently who was in a terrible, you know, backslidden state, committing adultery, all kinds of terrible stuff going on. He's in the ambulance on the way to the hospital and he hears the guy in the, in the ambulance say, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it to the hospital. And he said, he just cried, Lord, help, Lord, help. And God got him through and everything, he changed everything and fixed everything, got everything was mercifully restored. But it's just that awareness. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what it says. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. If you hang around me long enough, you'll hear me calling. If you're early on, you want to hear me calling out in, in the office. <laughs> it's just, I'm, you know, at any point, Lord, help. Maybe not when you're, you know, walking down the street or something. But you know what I mean? Just keep calling. Call to him. So the difference in distress and deliverance is a call. So let's have a look now quickly at his deliverance. First thing for us to see is it is a decisive deliverance. He's tangled up in weeds. You think, I'm, I can't get out. And you can think that. You can think, no, it's game over. I am bound. God's ability to cut through that and just snatch you and bring you out is extraordinary. Absolutely amazing. If you are feeling ensnared in a sin, be sure that you are calling to him about it. Don't let this stay closed while you get further entangled. Simple thing, basic, so obvious. Call out to him, Lord, help. Lord, help. Make sure that he knows that you want his help. Don't leave, don't leave any ambiguity about it. I remember my brother was going through a big challenge at one point, and I just said to him, look, pray about it until you know you've prayed about it. <laughs> just, just bring it to God again and again if necessary. But we mustn't uh, think that, that, you know, that's it. No, there's a decisive deliverance. God comes and snatches him, sends this great fish, and he's just suddenly he's rescued from something that you think you can't get out of. People can get rescued from extraordinary binding situations. I've heard so many stories now of people being rescued from, you know, heroin addiction. You know, all kinds of desperate things you think that's, that person is finished with. And then God says, no, I'm going to save them now. And actually, what I'll probably do is turn them into a pastor and a church planter and a father. And, you know, you just think God's ability to bring us out of that is phenomenal. So we see it's a decisive deliverance. Secondly, we see there's a sense in which it's a delayed deliverance. <laughs> Firstly, delayed by Jonah's unwillingness to seek it. He doesn't ask. He could ask a heck of a lot sooner. You think, Jonah, why did you wait so long? Until you're the very, you know, like, yeah, okay, Lord, please, <laughs> it's like crazy. That's not delay. I trust that point's been made already. But in a strange way, and perhaps it's a little speculative, if you look at verses four and five, it says at the end of the top of page 921, if you're on the church Bible, then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Verse five, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. It may be that you could say that having made that decision, I will look. It's not instant. His deliverance isn't necessarily immediate. Now, it's a, it's a difficult thing because he's talking about his distress and his deliverance. They all get mixed in together, kind of like being underwater. It all gets a bit kind of, all everything gets mixed up together. So, you know, it says he answered me out of the, you know, and, and then he, so it, his descriptive, it's difficult to be overly strict about the chronology of the events here. But perhaps it could be said that having called, having made this decision, I will look to the Lord, things didn't instantly get fixed. And we need to bear that in mind that sometimes we can be asking God for help and nothing seems to be changing very quickly. And that is not a time to stop asking. That's not a time to stop looking. We look and we ask until you just keep going. So don't, don't be discouraged when you think, but I've been praying for him or for her or for me or for whatever it is. Don't think, well, I did that. I tried. Yeah, you're saying, you know, tell God I'm struggling with sin. I've been doing that all the time and I'm still struggling. Yeah, I understand. I understand that. Don't stop. Men are always to pray and not give up. You just keep going. Don't stop. The deliverance will come. The deliverance will come. But sometimes there is a delay and we must press on. So we see there's, it's a decisive deliverance. It's a delayed deliverance. Thirdly, it is a difficult deliverance. He's swallowed by a fish. 
It's not like I cried out to God and suddenly I was in a five-star hotel and everything was really cool. He is in a fish. That doesn't sound fun. That sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I mean, I think the thought of being in a fish's belly for three days, that's a horrifying thought. I'd be absolutely terrified. Now, there's a sense in which when God delivers us, it's not necessarily an end to difficulty. We must recognize God's imposition or his, his intervention in our life, his saving of us, doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. Sometimes there's tremendous difficulty. Now, Andrew's spoken recently talking about how when, you know, God kind of got a hold of his life and there was that kind of salvation that starts to kind of break in. And yet he said for the next months. It was just sorrowful repentance, learning. I mustn't do that. Learning. I must. Sometimes our Christian walk can be full of real, genuine difficulty. And for him, he was in a real state of difficulty. But better to be in the belly of the fish than in the belly of Sheol. He has been rescued. He's also being rescued. And he will be finally rescued, as our salvation is. We've been rescued. We're being rescued. And we will be fully rescued. So we see it's a difficult deliverance. And fourthly, finally, before we conclude, it's a directed deliverance, a directed deliverance. And what I mean by that is this. He isn't simply just kind of set free. It's not just like, oh, he's in trouble. Get him and put him somewhere safe. He is actually brought into something. When we ask God for his salvation in our lives, we don't just get moved from captivity to freedom. We get moved from captivity to being brought into the purposes of God. Jonah gets brought into the belly of the fish and actually becomes something of a pattern for the life of Jesus, where there's going to be a death and a resurrection. Now, we are brought into an identification with Jesus when we are saved. We're not just saved into, off you go. We're saved into the freedom of knowing Christ and actually experiencing his liberty. He's brought into conformity to Christ's pattern. And that's what salvation looks like, being brought closer to who Jesus is. That's where true freedom is found. And also, his deliverance comes into the direction of actually being sent on mission. And similarly for us, as we are rescued, we are brought into God's mission on our behalf. Now, I just want to draw things to a close by pointing out that Jesus said that this whole thing that happened with Jonah was really pointing to him. He said the sign of Jonah. A sign points to something, and he's saying it was pointing to himself. He said, for just as Jonah was in the three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah's sin led to the distress of his companions and his own distress, and the causing of all kinds of problems. But Christ's distress was on account of our sin. And he suffered God's opposition. God orchestrated all of that. And God offers us hope through what Christ suffered. We don't look at Jonah's story to say, oh, I must copy that. We look at Jonah's story to say, Jesus plunged into death, snatched me out, brought me up with him into a new life. Salvation comes through him. It's a decisive deliverance. He brings us out of things we could never think we'd, you know, we'd think we'd never escape from. Sometimes it's difficult. It includes delay. But he is bringing us in his direction into his story where there's true freedom, true deliverance. Salvation ultimately belongs to our God. Let's pray and we'll have the bread and wine. And uh, we've got bread and wine here at the front, bread and juice at the back. And... Uh, could lead us in a song we just have a moment just to bring our hearts to god in response to what we've heard lord jesus we do thank you that you plunged into death itself on our behalf there's no speculative ambiguity as to whether or not you died you were dead your pulse stopped and the weeds were wrapped about your head lord you were well and truly dead in the grave Jesus, please help us to understand that in our moments where we're tempted to yield to hopelessness and despair, you're still underneath us, ready to pick us up. You're still beneath us. We'll not get lower than your loving reach. Thank you. All it takes is a call, a look, a look in your direction, a look towards your cross. Help us, Lord, to find the freedom of conformity to you living your way. 
Lord, we pray, draw us ever closer to yourself. Help us be strong in this great salvation that you've given to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.